Hi, everybody. Stefan Molyneux from Freedom Main Radio. Hope you're doing well. So I'm here with Mike. Uh, Mike and I work together at Freedom Main Radio, and uh, we have been known to discuss politics from time to time. It happens. And, uh, well, it's been, <laughs> it's been quite a couple of days in the American uh, political scene. If there was, in fact, a CB scanner for politics, I think the phrase would be, ah, Fat Dracula is down. Fat Dracula is down. <laughs> and um, Cruz is out uh, just today, wasn't it, Kasich? Kasich has, is going to uh, announce very shortly, just as we're recording this. So, yeah, now it's just Trump. He's going to pick up the rest of the delegates, and he is most assuredly the Republican nominee. Yeah, Kasich has pulled out faster than the Catholic man. So <laughs> uh, it looks like uh, we are down to one, uh, which out of, what, 17 it started with? Yep, 17 we started with. 17. And Trump faced, someone did the math and added up $75.7 million in negative attack ads over the course of the entire primary. How much? 75 point seven million dollars in negative you know attack those ads. cheap bastards you gotta you gotta know if they'd gone for 75.8 million they totally would have won just for the sake of a hundred thousand dollars but that's still less than what bush spent if george soros would have just campaign. dug into the couch cushions on his uh in his living room he could have possibly swung the election away from trump but you know and this this is what i i fucking love this I, I love this what i love so much is it's possible that we've reached peak trollery on the planet like because if this level of character assassination slander libel and verbal abuse doesn't seem to do much to slow and, in fact, may even accelerate someone's campaign. It means that they're kind of out of arrows, you know, like these people who just dump on people and create negative impressions of people. If their stuff isn't working, God, we might actually be able to have a conversation about something important rather than he's a oogie boogie <laughs> or whatever they said. If you listen to the Never Trump people, very clearly the mainstream media is in the bag for Donald Trump and supporting his campaign and not vetting him whatsoever. Absolutely, because you, you spell support, R-A-P-I-S-T. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's one of the ways that they've just really, really helped the Donald along. No, it's fascinating. The degree to which people have stopped listening to the chattering classes, it's glorious. It's absolutely with the With the combined weight of the Republican establishment, the media, the trolls, the leftists, the um, some Hispanic groups, like just the massive amount, racist, misogynist, rapist, like you name it. And he just like it's it's like watching an ice an ice destroyer go through a couple of ice cubes. And God, can you imagine if, if the tyranny of verbal abuse, aka media and politic media and political establishment, if that has taken a body an orange-faced body blow like this, my God, we might actually have room to discuss something even remotely important. It's possible. Well, it's not just the mainstream media, too. It's a lot of alternative media outlets, which, you know, people flocked to to get away from the mainstream media narrative and the constant race baiting and all that, which then they were subjected to with these alternative media outlets, which have seen their customers vanish in droves as they completely adopted all the behavior that people have sworn away from the mainstream media from. So that's uh, that's an interesting development as well. You're getting to see lots of people's true colors. There's lots of non-market facing institutions out there and in alternative media and think tanks and all that type of thing. Lots of people getting money from big donors that have interesting opinions about Donald Trump, who, you know, is against the interests of many of these donors. And it's it's just interesting to see these people come out of the woodwork with their non great arguments against Trump. But, you know, the people that sign their checks, eh, they seem to like it, seem to like the coverage. <laughs> So, Mike, when you say we're seeing people's true colors, would any of those colors be Cheeto colored? <laughs> you sent, like, Mike, just for those who don't know, uh, Glenn Beck, um, or as he was formerly known, the same Glenn Beck, has decided to mock Trump by rolling his face in a bowl of Cheetos. I guess that's supposed to represent Trump's Cause, uh, cause color. Because Trump's uh, fake tan makes him look a bit orange. So, naturally, the first thing you do to demonstrate that would be to rub your face in a bowl of Cheetos. You know, now because that's you an want argument. to maintain some semblance of credibility, that's the first thing I'd do. You know, why not? <laughs> why not? The degree to which people don't know that a gif on repetition, you know, you ever do this where you, I used to do this when I was a kid, you take some word and you just keep repeating it over and over until it just sounds completely weird. And you can try this. Try this at home, kids. It's, you know, it's an interesting way to while away life before computers. And uh, the gif of, of Glenn Beck rolling his face in Cheetos as a political statement it's not exactly a Tibetan monk on fire as far as power goes, but it really does uh, 
uh, show. To me, Trump is like a credit card uh, insofar as apparently when you're uh, a coke addict, right, you, you put your coke and you cut it, right? You cut it in the middle and you, you separate it for reasons that I have no idea about. And Trump is like that credit card whoosh, right down the middle and he just separates. There's, there doesn't seem to be much middle ground. Uh, people are just flocking to one side or the other. And uh, that, that kind of dividing line could be so clarifying. Well, I don't, it's like, I, I just want to point this out too. I don't look at the dividing line as being, you know, people that are anti-Trump and people that are pro-Trump because you can not be a Trump supporter and offer reasonable fair coverage of Trump, but it's the people that are just verbally abusive, manipulative, throwing, you know, racist, misogynist, and a whole lot of other additional words covered in the untruth about Donald Trump that I'm not going to mention at him that, uh, you know, they have now no credibility whatsoever to offer any criticism of Donald Trump, even if it is warranted in the future. That's something I don't think these people truly understand, that if they're so concerned about Donald Trump for whatever reason, let's say there's maybe a legitimate reason, now no one is going to take anything they have to say seriously because they've been so staunchly full of nonsense for the last, well, since August, practically. So. It's a very, very true phenomenon that if you insult the king and get kicked out of the court, you no longer have the ear of the king. <laughs> and there is this weird thing where people on the right, the Republican pundits and so on, I mean, you expect it from the left. The left is just going to, you know, take slow, squatting verbal dumps all over whoever they don't like and call it an argument. But on the right, I don't understand fundamentally how people can miss the fact that if you attack and insult Donald Trump, you are attacking and insulting the majority of, Demo of Republican voters and the Republican establishment uh, voter base, not, not the ones like the kingmakers, as Schlafly called them. It's not just like Trump is some isolated incident and you attack him with no ripple effect. You attack, like, but, but you're not attacking him. The people who support Trump view attack on Trump as an attack upon themselves, their judgment, their patriotism, their political acumen, their issues, their concerns. I just don't understand how that's, you know, attack him all you want. Yeah, fine. You know, you can find things to criticize. But this insane, like psycho ex-girlfriend stalker stuff. Uh, you can criticize so someone insulting. without being just malicious and, uh, you know, verbally abusive. I mean, we've criticized Trump regarding the Apple and FBI case, came out pretty strongly against his position on that. You don't have to be abusive. State your case, make your argument, leave it at that. But the people that and be are, balanced yeah. and talk about the stuff he's gotten right. And, and as far as um, uh, immigration goes, I mean, he is right on par with a significant majority of Republican voters. And as it turns out, quite a few, few Hispanics and blacks as well. Yeah, when you say so everyone these that's are concerned issues. about immigration is a racist, you're calling uh, <laughs> the majority of the voting base of the Republican Party racist, which isn't going to work out too well for you long term. And take a hint from the fact that, what was it, 70 something million dollars in attack ads 75.7 <laughs> 7. 5. million dollars that is um that hasn't swayed people so throwing your own little pile of vitriol onto a big pile of acid that hasn't worked you know trump is like this this lead eating strength growing monster like you know shoot at the guy and he just, he gets stronger. And so people are taking their little pistols and trying to shoot at him, uh, metaphorically or verbally, and he just gets stronger. And I don't, like, why can people not see this? If you want to oppose Trump, fine, do it in an intelligent way. But this knee-jerk, reactive, insane response, it's, it's Pavlovian. It's like watching a bird attack a mirror thinking it's king of the world. And this is not anything new. There was a pollster that sat down a bunch of Trump supporters and played, like, I think two hours worth of... <laughs> Like every negative Trump ad, every neg negative Trump thing that you could possibly throw at these people. And at the end, no one had changed from their opinion regarding Trump. Yeah. So yeah. this information was out there a long time ago. And yet, you know, I think Ted Cruz dumped six million dollars in the advertisements in Indiana just recently. And yeah, you know, it didn't work. Shocking. <laughs> I love, I love the fact that those people have wasted their money. <laughs> not only just, do they not get the ear of the next potential president, they, uh, now they're on the enemy list, and they threw it all in the toilet. Don't you love it? Don't you love to see the Republican establishment, hell, the political establishment as it stands? Don't you love it to see them actually finally get what's coming to them? It's kind of delightful. Oh, it is. It is. And, and I hope, you know, my hope is I've always talked about, or as we've always talked about in this campaign, but speaking for myself... My hope is that he shows people that you don't have to be afraid of the verbal abuse of the media. You don't have to be afraid of people hating you. 
because they have so very little power. If you're talking about important issues, if you are meeting people where they live and, and addressing their deepest fears and hopes, then the verbal abuse doesn't really matter. They're like a bunch of starlings flying around the head of King Kong, you know, <laughs> and I, because it seems dangerous before you see someone survive it. And uh, it's sort of like a, if you see someone running at a boulder, uh, you think they're going to hurt themselves. But if it's a hologram and they run right through it, then it becomes a fun game. And that's my hope, that it, it, it helps people to become more courageous when speaking out about their important issues in the public sphere, realizing that Donald Trump has done it in a way. Can you, ma can you imagine sitting down with a bunch of consultants as Donald Trump? Uh, as Donald Trump and saying, okay, here's the things I want to talk about. Here's the issues I want to address. Here's the, you know, I want to talk about immigration. I want to talk well, about more sensible policy. We haven't done 10 rounds policy. of polling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or these people would say, oh, no, no, that's a terrible, you're going to be called a racist. It's going to be terrible. You want to start we'll off get talking Hispanic about. Hispanic vote. <laughs> yeah, you want to start talking about Mexican rapists? Are you kidding me? That's an, and the, so the entire political establishment, almost without exception, and as you point out, a good number of the people in the alternative media have been proven to be spectacularly, entirely and completely wrong. And uh, to, to toot our own horn a little bit, we have been proven entirely and, cor and completely correct about the issues uh, of importance to Americans and the fact that Donald Trump addresses them. All right, hold on, so, Steph, hold on. I want to read something out that's uh, yeah. <laughs> kind of related to that. So RNC chairman Rents Priebus, which is the worst name ever, by the way, um, today he said, you know what? I think something different and something new is probably good for our party. Look, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've lost. I'll call it a choice. <laughs> look, I don't think anyone predicted what happened. So look, we're here. We're going to get behind the presumptive nominee. Well, like you said, boy, it's nice of you to finally come around to this decision after it became inevitable. <laughs> And you don't have a choice. And also, apparently, Ann Coulter, Scott Adams, Mike Cernovich, Joe Scarborough, and uh, Stephen Malinu don't exist, as far as people that predicted this way back when. And there's some more, too. But uh, it's a short list of people who figured out this Trump thing very early on. And, uh, you know, Ann Coulter is at the, the front of that list, without question. And this is their job. The, the job of these political elites is to understand the zeitgeist of the American public. It's not to manipulate them. It's not to push an agenda. Their job, supposedly, like a doctor's job is to figure out what's wrong with you and give you the right medication, not to pull from his array of bribed medication <laughs> behind the counter and jam that up your ass because it's you know good for his profits. And so uh, we'll put links to this below, but um, the number of people who were so spectacularly wrong. Um, I'll just read a couple of headlines and, you know, you can follow this up as you see fit. How Donald Trump could win and why he probably won't. And that's the nomination. Donald Trump is surging in the polls. Here's why he won't win. <laughs> Trump has about a 5% chance of winning. Um, any story based on the bookie. premise that Trump, any story based on the premise that Trump has any chance of becoming the nominee, let alone president, is a disservice to the reader. See, don't, don't want to be deserving the reader. <laughs> Donald Trump has no serious chance of winning. Joke candidate. Um, that's a political scientist uh, saying this. And I mean, okay. this it goes on and on. Uh, uh, Bill Crystal uh, is one of these uh, people who um, has made all of these predictions about there's just no way that Trump could advance. And he's a, a goof and a clown. And all this kind of stuff is not, it's not a serious candidate. I always love that. Like, like what, is, what does that mean? But somehow I mean, John Kasich is a serious candidate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, uh, not a serious candidate means... I don't like him. Uh, but, you know, it sounds a little bit tough to say that. So people have said, well, he's not a real candidate, you know, but, you know, try headbutting him. I think you'll find otherwise. <laughs> he's not really a Republican, despite the fact that he actually deals uh, with the issues of most importance to Republicans and the fact that Republicans are getting behind him um, hook, line, and sinker. But apparently he's not really a, Republic, a Republican because apparently there's some platonic ideal of a Republican that can be whatever you want. He's not a real candidate because he'll be, he'll be long gone by the time Iowa comes along because he seriously won't win because everyone will laugh at you for even thinking that Trump could win because it's going to be Marco Rubio um, because he's never been tested because, because, because I'll leave the party uh, if he wins. <laughs> uh, and every single time, this time Trump has gone to, you can see this man called Rotura, this time Trump has gone too far. He's finally shot his own campaign in the foot the and he's all, he's the 400 supporters collapsing. Trump going too far. Yes. Yes. Yeah. His, his support is finally collapsing and it's all over. And it's just like, you like, 
it's really revealing the degree to which the chattering classes are pushing an agenda that has nothing to do with the will of the people, and they're not there to inform you, they're there to control you. Well, on the vein of what you're saying as far as not just uh, not just being wrong, like getting it objectively wrong, but pushing an agenda, you know, many times right before the primaries, they a poll would get pushed out that would show, you know, whoever was number two to Trump surging in that poll. Now, it would be like the only poll that would show such a surge, but then that's all they would talk about in the days before the election. Look, so-and-so is surging. They're doing great. Trump is falling. And then the election would happen. It would line up with previous polling or, you know, close. It wouldn't be anything close to this poll that just, you know, showed up and was talked about nonstop on news for two days and then vanished. And there's no circling back. And this happened multiple times right before the primaries. And it's like, oh, so you've just done a poll that's completely skewed, that serves your agenda, and you're pushing it out to get people to think that, oh, look, Trump supports collapsing. Oh, no, I don't know if I can support him if he's, his support's collapsing. This guy's surging. Maybe I'll go vote for this person. It's, it's also blatantly transparent when you see the exact same things happen time and time again. It just shows you the degree to which the system is rigged. And what you were saying earlier, Steph, about, okay, Donald Trump had, didn't fold in the face of all this verbal abuse, torrents of negative comments, racist, misogynist, all that. That's part of the component. The fact that he is a very strong individual that was willing to take that type of verbal abuse and not fold like many people would, not apologize to the social justice warriors. Maybe he read Vox Day's book. Um, but there's the other element, which means, you know, he has $10 billion in the bank. He has the media experience, 43 years of media experience and being a public figure to the point where he couldn't be ignored, like a Ron Paul. Ron Paul didn't have... $10 billion in the bank. He didn't have 43 years of media experience. So the media could just ignore him, whether you like Ron Paul or not. They could just easily ignore him, make him some like cartoony old fuddy duddy grandfather, and then just not talk about him and dismiss him. And, you know, if you don't get enough sunlight, you're not going to grow. Well, Trump, Trump could go to 7 Eleven. It would be covered by every news station just because he's Donald Trump. And he's got the, he's got the drawing power, he's got the charisma, he's got the personality. And he continued to be a ratings winner to the point where he just crowded out all the other candidates. They just cannibalized, you know, the establishment essentially cannibalized itself because, oh, you know, we want this, this advertisement money. We have to cover Trump. Trump is so interesting. What is Trump doing? What did Trump say today? That, uh, you know, Jeb Bush is, you know, <laughs> Jeb Bush made the comment that he could moon someone and not get covered for it. Meanwhile, Trump eats a Snickers bar and all of a sudden it's front page news. So just the fact that he... You know, he is literally a once in a lifetime lightning strike of an individual that could potentially do this. There's, you know, even if you're willing to stand up to the, the verbal abuse, if you don't have these components, such as the money to fund your own campaign, because no one would fund a campaign that's against the interests of major global corporations, which is frankly what Trump is running on. You know, they don't want these closed borders, these major global corporations. They want the cheap labor, which is why you get, you know, Jeb Bush and all the Marco Rubio and all the other soft and immigration candidates coming through because it benefits the big business establishment. And, you know, the fact that Trump could fund his own campaign, said, hey, I could talk about the issues that the people want me to talk about. And then on top of it, they couldn't ignore him because he's got the high Q rating and he's got the personality. So without he, these he various brings the elements, eyeballs. yeah, without these various elements, this perfect storm of the Donald Trump candidacy wouldn't be where it is today. It's really just remarkable. I mean, I, we've talked about politics for many years and the idea that someone like Donald Trump could come into the landscape and have, have accomplished what he's accomplished in such a short time, it was unthinkable, completely unthinkable. The idea that you'd have someone in there that's not taking massive amounts of donor money and it's actually, you know, I mean, he's talking about the stuff that my uncle would talk about at Thanksgiving dinner, you know, a decade ago. Damn NAFTA, you know, <laughs> all the jobs are going overseas. Nothing's made in the USA anymore. And, you know, <laughs> you're not saying that's exactly uh, on the nose, amazing uh, policy, but it's the heart and sentiment of what people have wanted for a long, long time. And that was evident in 1992 when Ross Perot, again, someone with lots and lots of money, but didn't really have the spine of determination, nor the, the Q rating and appeal of Donald Trump. They could paint him as, you know, hoaxy folksy guy with a funny accent who likes using charts and holding up signs and uh, pretty much dismiss him. And he still did relatively well and ended up giving the election to Clinton, but that's a whole other story. Um, but he talked about the giant sucking sound regarding the NAFTA. And he got lots and lots of support in 1992 because of that. So, you know, this is, this is not new that people are concerned about NAFTA, that people are concerned about immigration. This has been going on for a long time, 
But unless you have these certain elements that enable you to bypass the establishment cartel that is our current political system, Donald Trump wasn't going to happen. And it's and his success, if you know, having these these um, qualities, his success is actually easily predictable, just in the sense of. Donald Trump's a free market guy. He's been operating in the free market for 43 years. He's not one of these politicians that's been in political office for 30 years and in around the political apparatus for 30 years that loves the free market and talks about the free market despite having spent zero time in it whatsoever. He's a free market guy used to winning in the free market, and there's a bunch of old, lazy cartel establishment Republicans and Democrats that are just used to getting what they want as long as they shuffle the right amount of money at the right people. Well, eh. Sorry, the free market is now in <laughs> the free market has arrived and its name is Donald Trump and he's going to take your political system and you're going to lose. And he spends much less money than a traditional campaign would while getting far better results. Hello, free market efficiency. <laughs> I mean, the free market even does politics better than the government does. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. But yeah, you know, no one predicted this whatsoever, of course. Completely out of left field. Who could have seen this coming? All right. <laughs> Priebus, you delightful, delightful RNC chairman, you. Now let's 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 take a moment to to circle back and review the brief rise and fall of our good friend Rafael Ted Cruz. Um, quite the week. He, I mean, this is a week for the ages in political speak. Um, I have a timeline. Can I run through it, stuff? <laughs> It's pretty. I just wanted to point out that uh, he, he was a bright light, but so is a meteor. But it's just because it's shredding itself in the atmosphere and falling in ash. So, uh, yeah, why don't you give us a timeline? Was this the last week's timeline? Uh, I think like the last 10 days or so. He's, a, he's right. a bright light, like like the person who, you know, douses themselves in gasoline and self-emoliates on the stairs of some Capitol building, Ted Cruz. So the, the latest in this series of... Uh, ideas was this alliance with John Kasich, you know, we're going to, we're going to team up and I'm not going to campaign here and you're not going to campaign there. And, you know, we're going we're to and... combat the free market guy with a cartel. <laughs> oh, good signal guys. So, so the voters seem to think that, uh, you know, their votes don't count and that the establishment <coughs> against, against Donald Trump. So what we're going to do is we're going to team up as the establishment candidates and try and team up against Donald Trump two on one. The optics of that are beautiful and uh, that's going to really work. No, it just, pretty much made people continue to think that it was everyone in the planet against Donald Trump and their alliance. I think it, I think it barely day. lasted a day. Yeah. It was a day, in, right? In case it began to like, no, I want votes in, you know, the states that be agreed previously to <laughs> not campaign. And it's like, oh, yeah, when God. the guy's coming in to hug you and he's got a shiv, <laughs> it's not going to be a very cold mock moment. <laughs> well, well, what a great deal you negotiated there, Mr. Cruz. Fantastic. Didn't last a day. And the guy backstabbed you. <laughs> Absolutely right. fantastic. So then, then the next brilliant idea was, all right, we're going to take and announce a vice presidential nominee. And Ted Cruz, whose campaign was failing, his numbers were plummeting ever since the Colorado debacle, which we did an interesting video on, which you can check out if you like. The truth about the Colorado delegate controversy, I believe. Um, said, I'm going to announce my VP pick, which, of course, lots of people laughed at because the loser announcing a VP pick you know, like, okay, we get it's kind of a desperation. If you're, uh, last if, you're, if you're a seaman promoted to vice captain in the last eight minutes of the movie <laughs> Titanic, your career is not going to be very illustrious. And then the fact that he picked Carly, who, you know, just had that brief moment on her first big stage debate performance where, you know, she said a, a couple of her cant lines very well. And, you know, people said, oh, Carly. And then she immediately dropped like a stone because she did nothing to follow up on it. Um, and she was out of the race for quite a while. So it's like, all right, we have a failed candidate. If I add this well, sorry, candidate, to I just wanted to mention too, she, she would have done a lot better. Like, because, you know, they, they backed on Donald Trump for saying, can you imagine that face? So can you picture that face as the president or whatever? Mm -hmm. Now, if she'd have said, you've got to be kidding me. Let's talk about the issues. I don't care what he's got to say about my face. I'm a big girl. I can take care. Like if she'd come out like that then that would have helped a lot because that would have been humiliating to the media and would have raised people's respect that she wasn't playing the V card, you oh, know, absolutely. the victim in the vagina card, right? Absolutely. But the fact that she didn't push back hard against the media for this ridiculous comment about the face, combined with the fact that she'd made fun of another woman's hairdo or something, which was caught on an open mic, if she'd have done that, I mean, she would have uh, still had a, a, a good swing uh, at least getting a round or two further. Well, she just revealed herself to be Hillary with an R, pretty much, <laughs> when it comes to mentality. So... 
the idea that Cruz, you know, he picks the woman. I mean, oh God, what a cucky move, just right off the bat. <laughs> you know, he, he picks the woman, you know. And uh, another merger, another Carly merger failed. Shocking. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> if only someone could have seen that coming. Um, <laughs> HP, hopeful president. Oh, crater. <laughs> so then there was the endorsement, not endorsement of Indiana <laughs> Governor Mike Pence, who I don't know if you saw this video, Steph, but I think everyone, everyone go and watch this video of Mike Pence not endorsing while endorsing Ted Cruz. It's like, boy, Donald Trump's great. I really have a lot of respect for Donald Trump and what he's doing, what he's doing. He's fantastic. Donald Trump's great. I am nothing. This is not saying anything negative about any other candidates, but I'm going to vote for Ted Cruz. And that's like the whole thing. <laughs> and, 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 and then off the mic, can I, is, is my wife still in this windowless <laughs> van? Can I get her back yet? I mean, I said what the guy wanted me to say. Can I get my wife back? I've never quite seen endorsement by gunpoint before, but that, that's the closest approximation to. Uh, <laughs> to and I, off camera, they're person. holding back the Siberian tigers. <laughs> So then, after that, um, there was Ted Cruz deciding to get in a, a verbal jousting match with a 12-year-old. Because, you know, <laughs> you want to talk about Donald Trump and maturity, you want to start getting in a shouting match with a 12-year-old. And then talk about how, uh, you know, one of the things that hopefully someone has told you is that children should speak with respect. Imagine what a different world it would be if someone would have told Donald Trump that years ago. In my household, when a child behaves that way, they get a spanking. Yes, fantastic, Ted Cruz threatened domestic abuse against a 12-year-old who's not even your own child. That's great. Well, and he was talking about his five-year-old daughter. Oh, yeah, and he's made jokes before about, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton the, being given a spanking by the voters just like his five I'll, I'll give you the quote. He, says, he said, you know, I'll tell you in my house if my daughter Catherine, the five-year-old, says something she knows to be false, she gets a spanking. Well, in America, the voters have a way of administering a spanking. And of course, as we've talked about in this show, uh, spanking impairs cognitive development, raises behavioral disorders, increases risks of suicide. The studies have finally come in and, and they're unequivocal uh, about the negative effects. And, you know, a five-year-old, come on, man. And also, uh, I guess the voters do have a way of administering a spanking to Ted Cruz when he says things he knows to be false. Uh, so that, did, that, that prophecy did, in fact, come true. Yeah, and I'll just mention, because some people are surprised at uh, the spanking stuff. They think, well, you know, if you don't spank kids, they, you're going to wind up like these social justice warriors on campus that, you know, need hug rooms and this type of stuff. Not realizing that, uh, you know, 80% of kids in America are spanked, De depending on the survey, 70 to 80%. So uh, in order for that thesis to be true you would need for people not to be spanked previously. And that's the current number, not the number for the previous generation. So those social justice warriors, odds are they were completely spanked. And if they weren't spanked and, uh, you know, treated with authoritarian parenting, they were probably outright neglected. There's not a whole lot of really involved parents that have, you know, committed to peaceful parenting, no yelling, no screaming, no timeouts, actually negotiating with your children, you know, like an entrepreneur would in the free market. Hey, Donald Trump. Oh, Donald Trump was well, never I mean, spanked, the, by uh, the way. Just point that out. His father never spanked him, and he seems to be doing pretty good. But, <laughs> but Yeah, I mean, the social justice warriors, I believe, come from single mom households where they've never had a man to teach them how to roll with the punches and... uh uh, not ma emotionally manipulate when they're on the losing end of the stick, but to gracefully surrender the high ground and learn something. But that's perhaps a topic for another time. But yeah, uh, but can I just also... with an emotional reaction to what we just said, go check out our Peaceful Parenting playlist. There's lots of interviews with experts there with some interesting information. So give it a chance. Give it a chance. And uh, you were saying, Steph? I, didn't, I, will, I will get back to your timeline in a sec, but I, at an event in New Hampshire just recently, Cruz said, the Obama-Clinton foreign policy of leading from behind. The whole world is on fire. And when a little girl replied, the, w the world is on fire? Cruz responded by saying, yes, your world is on fire. And she freaked out. And it's just like, dude, she can't vote. Bad optics. <laughs> Please don't terrify the children. You're frightening the adults enough as it is. It was similar to him telling his five-year-old daughter about hell. You know? <laughs> well, that's right. a whole other thing. Okay. Right. Um, so then, next in the timeline was Heidi Cruz having to formally deny to a media rep that she had married the Zodiac Killer. <laughs> I don't get this, like, because I, I saw a really, really bad Larry Wilmore set. Race, 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 race uh, at the White House correspondence. I only made about 10 or 15 minutes. But he had the, what, I don't get the Zodiac Killer thing. What is the story? He, Ted Cruz it bears a striking resemblance to uh, the artist's mock-up of the Zodiac Killer. <laughs> 
Oh, is that right? So it's it's become a bit of an internet meme. And is the Zodiac Killer that woman who was on the television who looks like him, who's now doing porn? You told me. I didn't find this myself. Yes, the Maury Povich woman that looked like uh, Ted Cruz in drag that has now accepted an offer to do pornography. The internet is a wonderful place, isn't it, folks? <laughs> I think oh, she's man. a single mom, too. I could be wrong about that, but I, I think. Maury, I think that's pretty much an audience requirement, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Paternity test was probably administered. So, yeah, you know, when you're formally uh, having to deny that your husband is the Zodiac Killer, <laughs> I mean, it might be a sign that people aren't taking his presidential run that seriously at this point. Um, Speaking of porn, oh no, we'll get back to that. We'll we'll put the pause I, on porn. I'm not quite sure where you're going with that, but it's not like my timeline. We'll, um, <laughs> we'll circle back. You know, we'll we'll put the porn on the back burner, uh, and we'll we'll come back to that. But if you want to move on with your timeline, get your lotion ready, everyone. It'll be coming up in a moment. Um, <laughs> it rubs the lotion on its skin. <laughs> So the next thing was Carly, while giving a speech, fell off the damn stage, which another video where you kind of got to see it. You know, she's announces Ted Cruz and then arms go flailing and she disappears off the stage. <laughs> and there's a big ghostly Jesus finger poking her. Uh, no, there's not. But there should be. And then uh, like. Cruz doesn't even acknowledge it, doesn't even acknowledge it. And, you know, I can kind of get the fact that, you know, you don't want to like, oh, make a big deal out of it because it becomes more of a thing. Like maybe no one noticed that she fell off the stage. No, they, they noticed. Um, but, yeah, he didn't even help her. And I just can you imagine if Donald Trump didn't help a woman that fell off the stage right in front of him? Oh, my God. It'd be a news story cover to cover every single channel uh, for the next three days plus. Now, you can't see because of the podium, but my suspicion is he actually stepped on the side of her head to get at the microphone. But I'm not positive that that remains the unconfirmed, but I wouldn't be shocked. So th that's not good. You know, the optics of someone falling off the stage as your campaign numbers plummet. You know, there's there's a metaphor there that someone can work on. Um, and then then Ted Cruz decided. Wait, wait, wait. Was she was she pushed by Corey Lewandowski? That I need. To I know. haven't seen if Michelle Fields has a comment on it whatsoever, but uh, just maybe viewing the videotape put her into a coma, so she's not on Twitter. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the next, the next thing was Cruz deciding to engage some Trump supporters outside of a rally. There was some Trump protesters outside of his rally. You know, one of his rallies. That if you see the attendance numbers for these Cruz rallies over the course of the last week, it's not. It wasn't pretty. With a crowd measured in the dozens. And of course, they interview all the people. Oh, I thought there'd be more people here. Nope. Can can you all squish together a little bit so it looks like 0.01% of a Trump rally? Yeah, he had a he had a rally um, the day that he had that whole meltdown thing with Sean Hannity, uh, where he wouldn't answer the question that got him a lots of negative press. Uh, he had a rally that did like 175 people. And like it was a rather large venue and just, oh, God, you know, you can see the wheels coming off the car. Um, but. So Cruz outside one of his rally, there was, it looked to be like a dozen or so, at least that you could see on camera, Trump supporters. And he said, I'm going to go over and I'm going to talk to the Trump supporters. And, you know, I'll say that does take some balls to go just talk to some people on the street that are obviously against yeah. you. I mean, sorry, they're, they're, I mean, it kind of, but there's that Aristotelian mean, you know, like a deficiency of courage is cowardice, but an excess of courage is foolhardiness and it's just as dangerous. Well, you know, he's grasping at straws at this point. That's pretty clear. You know, it's the, the measured ideas. I mean, he just announced uh, Carly Fiorina is his vice presidential running mate when he's not the front runner. You know, he's just. He's going at straws, so what the heck? Maybe it goes really well. And people look at the courage of Ted Cruz. I'm going to vote for him. That obviously didn't happen. It wasn't going to happen, but he's trying something. Hey, give him that. So he goes out there, and it's a bloodbath. You, you know Ted Cruz with the pauses and his verbiage that you could drive a truck through? I mean, he, he just left so many openings. <laughs> My favorite head isn't, isn't that his form of hypnosis? Like the, those pores, I, I, I mean, I think it's just supposed to get you to dissociate. Like, I don't know, is he rebooting? Do I speak now? What's going on? <laughs> but he's like, something to the effect of, you know, the one question that every American is asking today, and he pauses, and one of the Trump people, just r perfect timing, like professional comedian level timing goes, are you Canadian? And... <laughs> I mean, I don't find that hilarious. That person should just have his own show. And it's called Are You Canadian? And that's all he does is shout, Are You Canadian? for a half an hour. I'd watch it. 
<laughs> but I mean that that was probably the highlight of the comedy. But it was it was brutal. I mean, it's one of those things that um, they were playing it on all the news channels, and you know everyone was just laughing. Even people that support Cruz were. Sh- I mean, it's just it came off so poorly. He looked so bad, and uh, you know he was trying something, but it it definitely failed. Definitely failed. So he had a really bad week, and to the point where. <laughs> Ted Cruz, as he's on stage after getting blown out in Indiana, about to announce that he's leaving the presidential race, announces it. He goes, you know, he hugs his wife and then he like hugs someone behind him. I don't know who it was. He ends up elbowing his wife in the face. He like he he reaches his arm over to like hug the guy behind him. He ends up like punching her kind of in the face. And then then he like moves his arm further and she catches an elbow from him right afterwards. And it's, I don't know if the skin mask that he wears to cover his reptoid face or, or whatever was too itchy or covering his eye sockets or what happened. But, I mean, a- another thing, like, can you imagine if Trump had done that? Donald Trump assaults his wife, domestic violence, oh, yeah. on the stage. I mean, it, th- this guy just could not win at this point. I mean, like, Ted, I find Ted Cruz to be pretty contemptible in many for many of the reasons that we've no, on the this show. Um, but, I mean, even I was starting to feel like, oh, could this guy just catch a little break? at all and then i remembered you know <laughs> then i remembered who ted cruz is and all the stuff that he's done and just how scummy he's been over the course of this entire election cycle and then i said nah, you know karma karma but yeah well it's uh, it's what we said at the beginning um, when we first started talking about this whole thing that nobody in the government likes ted cruz his colleagues don't like him uh, people don't want to work with him uh, he can't you know he's got to virtually kidnap people's children to get their endorsement and, um, you know, I guess um, as people got to know him better, uh, the likability did not skyrocket. Well, you know, it, it's funny, too, because one of the things that Cruz would always say is, you know, look at Trump's unfavorables. Look at his unfavorables, because, you know, there's a lot of people that don't like Trump. You know, that's pretty clear as, you know, the never Trump caller that called into the show that, you know, bought the media propaganda hook, line and sinker didn't like Trump. His own emotional bias reasons, maybe didn't like Trump. So there's people that don't like Trump. Well, his uh, that was his big argument against Trump. He can't win the general because of unfavorables. Well, his his unfavorables are a whole lot worse than Trump's. Uh, last time they were surveyed, you know, they add the, the favorables and the unfavorables together to see what you get. Um, and. <laughs> Cruz was a total negative six, and Trump was like a plus 26 the last time. So Trump was plus 26 favorability, and Cruz was even in the negative. So, I mean, it's probably the worst unfavorables of anyone in the vicinity of uh, the nomination in any recent time frame. And so, yeah, you know, it's, uh, writing was kind of on the wall there. Now, was this the week also in which Heidi Cruz uh, talked about her husband being an immigrant? You know, I didn't include that in the timeline, but that was also Probably another should. gaffe. Yeah, you know. Probably should. She, so, of course, everyone uh, is aware of the, the issue of whether or not Ted Cruz, having been born in Canada, is a natural-born citizen, according to the Constitution, which means he's eligible for the presidency. Now, you can go and look at the truth about Ted Cruz. We actually break this down to what several legal scholars are saying. But um, the gist is, and what seems to be the going opinion, is that if you are born in outside the land, outside of U.S. territory, you, um, you are not a natural-born citizen because it's an act of Congress, I believe, which makes you undergo the process of naturalization if you have a parent. Um, and, and this is off the top of my head. I researched it two months ago. So look in the presentation for the exact details. But the Ted Cruz is thought to be a citizen through the process of naturalization because the citizenship of his mother. So, yeah, the idea that his wife would say that, you know, Ted's an immigrant. Well, if he's an immigrant, he's not a natural born citizen, he's not eligible for the presidency. I don't know if this is just evidence of his wife hating him and subconsciously sabotaging his campaign. But, <laughs> you know, on things uh, that you don't want your wife to say if you're Ted Cruz, that's about high on the list other than I was fine with the affairs. <laughs> That'd probably be number right. two. So, good God, he did. He, I mean, probably one of the worst 10 days in political history. And it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. <laughs> there is um, something that is, to me, kind of sad about somebody who can't return a burn. You know, in politics, it's a lot about verbal back and forths and verbal burns and so on. John McCain once said that uh, Cruz's op- opposition to immigration reform made him a wacko bird, a wacko bird, which is, I think, an archived 
insult from McCain's youth somewhere around 880 BC. But um, Cruz said to CBS News, he said, quote, if standing for liberty and standing for the Constitution makes you a wacko bird, then I am a very, very proud wacko bird. Oh, Things you burn don't fail, say. burn fail. <laughs> it's just like, man, don't if you can't come up with a really good, funny burn back, just don't. Don't don't. This is like this is like me joking in Japanese. You know, it's just it's not going to translate. Humanoid cruise and humanoid speech, not simpatico. Get one of these people hire Scott Adams or Mike Cernovich to teach them persuasion, so they just don't say shit like that. Because God, where, where does basketball? Oh, ring the basketball it? ring. That's another one. Did Did he actually get down and propose to Heidi? Um, to his wife, did he propose to her by giving her an engagement hoop? I, you know, when you set up the thing in Indiana to to what what's the name of the movie? That that who's here? Yeah, it, it, when you're parroting a scene in a movie, at least know the verbiage. When you're parroting the basketball, you know, scene, at least if one of your interns or people, you know, explain to you that it's a basketball hoop and not a ring. I mean, I get it. You're not a basketball fan. You're a politician. You're kissing the babies and you're doing the basketball, you know, throwing out the first pitch. Blah, blah, blah. You know, you know jack about basketball, but you're doing this. God, can you at least get your verbiage right? This is Wikipedia. Wikipedia, for Christ's sakes. This is not hard. And Ted, you're very good at lying. You should, I mean, you must have been tired that day or something. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. But, and look, everybody has those gaffes. I mean, it's, it's you know, the what people don't understand, of course. I mean, people could take, you know, my 3,000 plus uh, shows. They could splice together well, a whole bunch of... Trump's had those, too. Hubby, hubby. Trump's had but, those um, too. Trump called, uh, it was in Buffalo, he called um, 9-11, 7-11. What, and people are like, oh, look at that, look at that. And it's, you know... <laughs> but you know what's funny, too, is that... Um, Obama has had a massive number of those. There's actually compilations on YouTube of Obama's verbal gaffes. You just never, ever hear them because media lefties, right? Yeah, and, you know, when you're doing sometimes two or three speeches a day that are an hour long and you're not speaking without a prompter, you know, you're going to flub a few few words. It's going to happen. You know, during the course of a three-hour show, you've been known stuff to maybe uh, mix a metaphor or two. It happens. <laughs> or three. Uh, and I also find it amazing because, you know, one of the things that politics is tough is it's tough on the voice. Mm. And Trump, first of all, a magnificent speech voice. Like th that speech voice, especially when he's fresh. I mean, it's like Freddie Mercury hitting a high note on somebody to love. Like it's fantastic. You know, the way he reads the snake. I mean, the man is not holding back from verbal acrobatics. And the fact that his voice is surviving so well. I mean, even Hillary's starting to sound like a croaking frog. Uh, but that that's just one of these accidents that he happens to have a really uh, pleasant uh, speech voice. Uh, and uh, none of the other candidates in particular I found did. And it's not a huge point, but it's also not an inconsequential point. You know, one of the problems with Ross Perot was he had a kind of a high speaking voice, was short, kind of jug eared and so on. So he was easy to mock. But Trump is just so relentlessly alpha that mm -hmm. he's he's kind of hard to mock from that. There's not one sort of, yeah, people pick on his hair like what the hell, right? But and Trump is the best just, body language of like any human being on the planet. Oh, that, I, I'm just voting for his hand. You know, like the, I just, I don't, I just, whoever, his very whoever long that fingers. hand is attached to, I want them in office, so to speak, because it's like that hand, it's so commanding. And it's just like, it's tracing death to leftism whenever he speaks like in the air, like that Picasso painting where he painted something uh, in air. And I, that, I just, you know, whatever that hand is doing, uh, I want the brain behind it. And, I mean, we know from the election cycle in politics, this stuff really matters. The optics, the fact that yeah. Ted Cruz's face looks like it's melting, you know, it, it, it. It matters. It really does. And, uh, you know, people make the jokes about Trump's hair and all that and appearance and all that. And but it's it's a thing. I mean, in the past, you know, oftentimes the more pretty candidate wins, you know, such as Canada. Or the taller candidate. I mean, all you have to do is go go by height. And, and you know, if, if it does turn out as it looks like it's going to be uh, Trump versus Hillary. I mean, this is like Andre the Giant up against Wallace Shawn. Uh, this is uh, going to be – and the optics of that, you know, big sort of commanding, tall, stocky-shouldered guy and then girl in pantsuit. Like, it's just going to be quite something to see. A grandmother in pantsuit. You know, it's uh, – yeah. they're, they're similar ages, but Trump does not come off as close to 70. Hillary comes off as, you know, just shy of 90. It's, uh, you know, and, and Trump's planted the stamina gambit. 
you know, so now whenever Hillary has a coughing fit, with which Matt Drudge loves to put on the front page, uh, people go, oh, man, I don't know if she can handle this. I don't know if she can handle this. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I, before we get to Hillary, because I, I have quite a bit to say on Hillary, I just I want to get in my joke about John Kasich leaving the presidential race to join the competitive federation of uh, competitive eating or something of the sort, uh, <laughs> given how disgusting his uh, his press conferences have been with him eating. You know, it is basically the it's Christmas. like a great white with a seal in slow motion, isn't it? Sort of that particular approach. <laughs> Something of the sort, but yeah. I, if I never have to see another photo of John Kasich eating, I, I, that'll be fine. I'll be okay with that. Um, again, who who schedules your press conferences where you're eating like Hagen Dazs or something while you're where you're talking to the media? You know, just don't don't do it. <laughs> yeah, have some peanut brittle and popcorn at the same time. <laughs> And then Trump, king of persuasion, starts talking about how gross Kasich is for eating. And no one looks good when they're like mid-bite. So now you have Kasich's photos of Kasich eating at every county fair for the last however years of his political career, you know, up on every website. And people are like, oh, that guy kind of looks gross. I don't want him to be my president. Like, it's it, stuff like that really works. It really well, works. it is. You know, I I have I'm an ambitious guy as a whole, and as you know, but I really only have one ambition left, which is to get through my entire mortal existence without Trump giving me a nickname. Because Trump's nicknames are just like God's arrows straight to your heart. Like at the moment, Trump tweets or nicknames you. I mean, you might as well just go go to some other planet and start again. If I wish I could observe the mental process where he selects the nickname. I believe it involves the ritual sacrifice of a goat to the evil Aztec gods, which give him the perfect moniker to destroy another human being. It is a form of sorcery, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> All right. So, Hillary, Hillary, you know, you say it's going to be Hillary and everyone's saying it's going to be Hillary. But you know what? I mean, there's a reason Sanders is staying in and isn't completely throwing in the towel. Cause... Well, assuming the FBI doesn't put their vote well, in. Yes. That's, I mean, that's the thing. There's so many kind of proverbial swords of Damocles hanging over Hillary's head that, you know, Bernie just hanging in there might get the nomination by default. Although I don't think that will happen. I think if something were to happen to Hillary, I think you're going to see Biden fly in there and get the nomination. Um, oh, man, I, I, I would because it's just it's the same as Republican establishment doesn't want Trump. The Democratic establishment does not want Bernie. And we've talked about that. And, you know, are they going to steal the election from Bernie Sanders? A presentation just showing again how crooked the political establishment is. Hey, your vote matters, except it doesn't. Sorry. Sorry about that. Well, and if if it's true, and I, I think there's a possibility, strong possibility that it's true. If Trump gets in, Hillary's going to be prosecuted. There's, I mean, to me, there's there's no doubt about that whatsoever. So Hillary is fighting for more than just, I'd like to get back into the White House. Mm. Because if Hillary's in, she becomes, you know, the degree to which presidents generally are kind of untouchable. And uh, so if Trump gets in, uh, it, it seems impossible to imagine that Hillary would not be prosecuted because he's already talked about how heinous her mishandling of security information was mm. and the degree to which other people have done far less and had their lives destroyed. So she's really fighting for a lot uh, in this uh, in this election. Well, and the love for the Clintons that existed in years past just really isn't there anymore. I mean, there's a new generation that's come around and even the older generation. I mean, they've just seen so much baggage with the Clintons that, you know, even that enthusiasm is is on the wane, which is part of the reason why Obama was able to, you know, usurp her and get his eight years. But now eight years later, ugh, I mean, she's she really is a terrible candidate. I mean, in every way, shape, or form, and it just shows how completely tilted the deck has been in her favor that she's that she's where she is right now, and that she's leading over Bernie Sanders. It's amazing she hasn't been able to finish off a 75-year-old socialist with you know no no debates practically before the first vote. Um, you know, she's got far more money. She's got everything tilted in her favor. She's got the name value. She's got, you know, Bill Clinton somewhere in a box that she can dust off and trot out, you know, which is more of a hindrance these days than it is a positive. More, more virgin blood. We need to resurrect the bill. <laughs> Find the Epstein Island. Um, you know, she's, she's got all this stuff going in her favor from the establishment and, you know, all the cards tilted in her direction. And she hasn't been able to finish off Bernie yet. I mean, that just shows what a weak candidate she is. And, you know, if it is her and Trump in the general, I mean, they're, they're the people that are going, well, I don't think Trump's going to win. I mean, unless it's like spontaneous lightning strike <laughs> or something, 
Trump is going to eviscerate this woman. I mean, you see what he's done to 17 other Republican candidates. You've seen what he's done to media figures. This is what he's done to his own side. And, and this is without having the Clinton's War on Women book written by Roger Stone. You know, you are going to see, you, you know, Monica Lewinsky on a stage holding a sign. You are going to see Juanita Broderick holding a sign. Elizabeth Ward Grayson holding a sign. Regina Bailey holding a sign. Kathleen Willey holding a sign. Sandra Ellen James holding a sign. Kathleen, uh, Kathy Bratchel holding a sign. There's a lot of names of people that have accusations against Bill Clinton. Oh, so just for those who don't know, these are, of course, because we've got to circle back for the youngsters, but these are women who have accused Bill Clinton, and, and fairly credibly too, in my opinion, uh, of, of rape or sexual assault. And these are also women that Hillary Clinton has reportedly hired investigators to uh, pursue and attempt to destroy. And uh, Cruz and Kasich have both said that they weren't going to go there when it came to combating Hillary, which to, to me is completely ridiculous. I mean, that's if the war on women is supposed to be against Republicans, why on earth wouldn't they uh, bring up the fact that Hillary Clinton is married to uh, an accused serial sexual a stalker and rapist, I think that might be considered a little bit more of a war on women than some tweets about Rosie O'Donnell. Well, again, back to what we were talking about before. Fundamentally, when it comes to the establishment, there is no difference between Ted Cruz and Hillary Clinton. It's, I mean, these are, they all get money from big donors. They're all, you know, they say one thing when they get in office, or they say one thing when they're on the campaign trail, and they're going to do another when they're in office, just like many of the candidates before them. You know, so it's kind of the uh, mutually assured destruction game that isn't pulled among the establishment favorites. You know, because neither, uh, you know, Cruz doesn't want his dirty laundry gone after by Clinton and uh, vice versa. So, you know, they just they don't go there. And then whoever wins, yeah, you know, <laughs> both of them are going to have careers anyway. It's how the system has worked. But now you have Trump, the free market advocate. The guy with $10 billion in the bank, who's not taking lobbyist money, not beholden to these corporate donors, the enemy of the establishment, and you're damn right he's going to bring this up. You're damn right we're going to essentially have Donald Trump as the trial attorney prosecuting Bill and Hillary Clinton live on the debate stage, live on every media channel over the course of all the months and all the time until November. And he has, through this process, the capacity to mortally wound the Democrat Party for half a generation. Because the degree to which, like, once this dirty laundry is out there, and a lot of people don't know it, because it's really studiously avoided by the mainstream media, pro-Democrat, I'll tell you, Steph, I didn't know that uh, there yeah, you didn't know, right? rumors that uh, Bill Clinton supposedly has a half-black baby. or <laughs> Not a baby now, now yeah, it's he had a, a son yeah, out of wedlock. Yeah, he had, he had it with a black hooker. Yeah, and uh, I saw the picture. Oh, my God, the kid looks exactly like him. And again, I have no idea, but, you know, there's no paternity test. There's no nothing. There's, you know, reports that, you know. Uh, well, and, and the corruption, yeah, the corruption that occurred, which we talked about uh, on this show, uh, the corruption that occurred when Hillary Clinton or the corruption that's uh, being investigated by the FBI when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State and Bill Clinton's speaking fees went up many, many, many times. I guess he just became a better speaker <laughs> overnight. Like this amount, like once the corruption of the Clintons is exposed, then the corruption of the Democrats will be exposed. And the mainstream media. Who and the mainstream media stuff. for covering it up. So to me, Trump is this big giant battering ram against the leftists in the mainstream media, in the alternative media, in the Democrat Party. The degree to which they are hypocritical and corrupt by allowing uh, a monster like Hillary Clinton to be at the head of their flagship that is like seriously people don't like they don't know they don't know what is going to happen but it is going to be an evisceration the hypocrisy and and contempt for any decent moral standards uh, on on the left the the hypocrisy of people attacking donald trump's character when you know this medusa is slithering forward to try and grab the reins of power i mean it is going to smash the left for a decade or two now Again, I mean, the, the right has its issues too, but unfortunately the left dominates the public discourse and until that is smashed, until uh, they're beaten back uh, with, with endless revelations of their hypocrisy, um, there's no possibility of having a rational discussion of anything in Western society until the verbal abuse of the left is beaten back. And if anybody's got a better plan to do it other than Donald Trump, I'm all ears. Yeah, and there's 
fundamentally, there's not much difference between the establishment Republicans and, you know, the spoken goals of the left. I mean, establishment Republicans are all open borders types. They're all, you know, oh, we don't need a budget. Why not? Obama wants this. OK, fine. Just, you know, <laughs> just, let's give him a blank check. And, uh, you know, it's also going to mortally wound all the Republicans who, you know, haven't brought any of this stuff up in prior election cycles. You know, you have Hillary as her tenure as Secretary of State with all this floating around where she's openly saying, well, this, this was more recent, but, you know, now she openly says every survivor of sexual assault deserves to be heard, believed, and supported. <laughs> you know, and uh, what did they do Unless then? they accuse my husband, in which case I will try to crush them. Yeah, how many people knew about the email thing and didn't say anything at the time? That's a big laundry list that spider webs out into every person that she sent an email to. Ah, that's yep. a lot of people. There's a whole lot of people in the establishment with a lot to lose. If Hillary Clinton is prosecuted or if she's not elected president, well, if she or some other establishment based candidate who's bought and paid for and receiving lots and lots of donor money to the point where they are controlled to do what they want. But on the Republican side, it looks like that's not going to happen unless there is the most amazing coup d'etat um, at the Cleveland convention for the Republicans, which seems very unlikely now. No, I, I, I mean, can't I can't imagine. fathom it now. I mean, it's uh, that would that would end the party like that. They, they might as well just all go home uh, and get real jobs that, that if they try to. I mean, the two guys have dropped out of the race because of ridiculous unpopularity. And if you look at the uh, Indiana election where Cruz got almost nothing and Kasich got nothing and Donald Trump dominated. I mean, oh, he's going to get just enough be to cinch it now. But, you know, sometimes are awarded afterwards and back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get that. But they, they, there's no way that they would just end the party. So uh, so now for the establishment people, even the establishment Republicans, it's Hillary or bust or some third party candidate, you know, because they everyone loses with Trump. The Republican establishment loses with Trump compared to Hillary because then the pay for play system stops. Yeah, then they can spend a lot of time opposing Hillary and getting donations for that and all that. Yeah, it's just certainly a lot of the Republican establishment is more closely aligned with getting Hillary into power than Trump. Mm -hmm. Well, if Hillary gets in, things continue business as usual. If Trump gets in, whether you like Trump or not, I think you can safely say it will not be business as usual. <laughs> it will yeah. not be business as usual at all. And now the question becomes, now the question becomes, is Trump going to be tempted to start taking Republican money? He has said that he will, um, previously he has said he will work with the RNC to raise money for the party. And this, this is the benefit of running as Republican or Democrat is you have the entire infrastructure of the party. You know, there's a reason why he didn't just go, I'm going to be an independent. It's really hard to run as an independent or one of the third parties that don't have an infrastructure. So the fact he's going to be raising money for the RNC, I mean, if, if that – he said that previously, that he would do that. Um, I mean, I don't like that. I don't. I understand why he would if I was in his position, you know. You know, are you going to write checks and pay for all this stuff yourself? And it's going to get pretty expensive, even with all the free media coverage he's going to get. Um, or, you know, you've made it this far. You're not bought and paid for. I, I, you know, you wouldn't go through that process if you don't have integrity in your values. Because um, he could have taken, taken money just the same and probably wound up just where he is right now. Uh, it, wouldn't have, uh, it would have been a big negative to people like me and you. But I don't think a lot of people have paid as much attention to the fact that he's self-funding his campaign and just how big a deal that is. I mean, to me, that is that the, is the whole that yeah, is the whole deal. That's the whole deal. That is that that is why he's able to talk about what he talks about mm -hmm. because he's self-funding his campaign. Yep. And again, with massive subsidies, so to speak, from the media who get advertising dollars every time they show Trump on, on the mm -hmm. screen. But the fact that he is self-funding, and you know, this is this is a, as much a condemnation of the system oh, yeah. as everything else, right? The fact that you know Donald Trump is the first aggregation uh, of this incredible constellation of talents, abilities, and resources in the history of politics. Like I literally have been racking my brain for months. I can't think of a single other political candidate who's done this. This is not an affirmation of statism. This no. is not an affirmation of democracy. The fact that it's happened once in the entire multi-thousand year history of democracy is not great. You know, it's 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 literally not a, a an endorsement of a system as a whole, but it is a very powerful way of undoing some of the hege he hegemony that exists. Yeah, and you know, if, if Trump gets in with this different variable that we've never seen before when it comes to democratic politics, I I am just curious for the information. What happens? Yeah. What happens? You know, does he does he stick by his guns and do a lot of the stuff that he says? I mean, I believe that he wants to build a wall. I don't think that that's you know lip service. I'm pretty sure that wall is getting built if he gets in office. I'm pretty sure he's going to do a lot of the other things that he's talking about. 
um, you know, he he sets his negotiating point high and then negotiates down, as any good negotiator will. But uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be an amazing data set that we will see if uh, there's a Trump presidency because he is completely unprecedented. And, you know, if, if the people don't get what they want with, uh, you know, the lightning strike of Donald Trump's talents, money, willingness to, you know, walk through fire um, and take all this verbal abuse, then democracy is just it can never work ever. No, <laughs> ever, no. Ever, if, ever. if yeah, that there's there's no possibility of uh, any faith for people. So, you know, people, if you still believe that there's any possibility of reforming the system, yeah, try and get Donald Trump into office and see what happens. Now, of course, you know, his his opponents will try and tie him up in various impeachment allegations and they'll try They're and already planning mess his him impeachment. up. Oh, yeah, I have no doubt about that. Like the same thing they did with uh, Reagan and Iran-Contra. They'll just try and wear him away and so on. Uh, and the system will formulate a defense of its own corruptions. And, uh, you know, this is not like, oh, he's won, therefore X, Y, and Z. We'll then get to see how the system is going to oppose him once he has the authority of the president. But that will also be incredibly instructive. And, and he has a very unique tool in that he, you know, he already has the bully pulpit and he's not a president yet. You know, if Donald Trump decides to make your life difficult, he can send out a tweet about you. And then there's all these news stories about you. You know, he, you know, he has a lot of power just with the amount of attention on him currently. And as the president, who can call a press conference whenever he wants to call a press conference? And Lord knows he will get the cameras there and he will interrupt, you know, Will and Grace or whatever the hell is on <laughs> NBC at the time. Um, if you are standing in the way of something that he wants done, he can go so-and-so is standing in the way of what needs to be done. And what do you, people... This is a democracy. What do you think about that? You know, <laughs> there's his phone number. Call his office. Let him know what you think. Let's see the will of the people, the voice of the people. I think you'll see uh, if he gets in that be used in a way that it's never been used with the presidency. And I believe that if he gets in power, he will accelerate the already existing decline of the mainstream media, which is a consummation devoutly to be wished if you want to have any rational conversations. The mainstream media has simply got to get out of the way uh, of um, uh, people having rational conversations based on fact and evidence because they are um, a bull in the china shop when it comes to the exchange of delicacies known as civilized discourse. Um, so and all that the posers is, in the alternative media too, which he's done a very good job of helping, uh, helping root out over the course of the last several months. Well, I said we'd finish off with porn. As I believe a lot of people often do. <laughs> people are getting blue balls waiting for your porn stuff. Ted you know, Cruz. Where are we going with this? Let's see. So Ted Cruz, while he was clerking for U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice William Rehnquist, actually that's the worst porn name ever. I just wanted to mention. In 1996, had to watch internet porn with the justices as part of the court's first cases dealing with the subject. Now, if I had a watching porn job in my past, you know, hey. We, we've all had our hobbies, but if it was a job, if it was part of my job description to watch endless amounts of hardcore porn, I don't know that I'd put that at the top of my resume. But Cruz, literally, and you can find lots of clips of this, and he really has the delivery down pat. He's practiced it a lot. He will tell this story quite a lot, and he will highlight it quite a bit. And he's actually even told uh, his experience uh, his experiences of watching hardcore internet porn as part of his job when there are children in the audience. Oh, oh isn't that no. just great to have parents? What's hardcore porn? Um, He's the most consistent conservative, them. honey. Let's just say that yeah, and we'll, forget about it. We'll watch some Black & Decker ads and just say that's what it is. <laughs> Something to do with drilling. But um, um, You know, watching a bunch of hardcore pornography next to a bunch of judges in big black flowing robes, that's a bit awkward. A little more awkward than if they were wearing casual dress And flags. there will be no black tents in the audience. Thank you very much. Oh, God. All right. I don't want the dry cleaning that bill. That explains for why it. Scalia died with a smile on his face. All right. Well, let, let's close off. Listen, I mean, we, we will occasionally, Mike and I will talk about this stuff anyway. So uh, if you find, you know, this uh, illuminating or instructive or, I don't know, just mindlessly entertaining as we do, uh, let us know in the comments below um, because we're always curious to get your feedback on what it is that we're doing. Uh, and um, uh, FDRURL.com, Amazon slash Amazon, use our affiliate link. Uh, if you like this show, of course, please, please, please help support uh, the costs of, of growing and researching and bandwidth and servers and all the stuff that takes it takes to deliver 
you know, five to 10 million shows a month. And uh, you can uh, do that at freedomainradio.com slash donate. Uh, thanks, Mike, as always. It's a great pleasure to chat. Uh, thank you for supporting this show. Please like, subscribe, and share. And last but not least, please follow me on Twitter uh, at Stefan Molyneux. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot uh, for your attention in these very exciting times.